Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, even the last time I cried like that on the stage was after the shellacking that he gave me <laughs> back four years ago. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you all just heard, I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics and I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum in the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, today's forum speaker is perhaps the most compelling figure, not just in the Republican Party, but in all of politics. In only his first term, Senator Rand Paul is already one of the front runners for the 2016 Republican presidential nomination, and is without question the Republican who best connects with millennial voters across the country. Not bad for an ophthalmologist from Bowling Green, Kentucky, who won in his first attempt for political office in 2010. I should know. <laughs> for you see, this is not the first time that I've shared a stage with Senator Paul. From 2009 in August through May 2010, we shared many stages, from Pikeville to Paducah, from Covington to Corbin, as we crisscrossed Kentucky seeking the nomination for the Republican Party to the United States Senate. Now, when the votes were counted on primary election day, Senator Paul got a lot more votes than I did. But I think we both won that day. He went on to become a United States Senator, and I got to be the director of the Institute of Politics. So in my capacity as IOP director, and for the last time here in the forum in that capacity, please join me in welcoming to the forum, Senator Rand Paul. You, Trey. I'm a little worried about this forum. You know, you never know where things can fly from. But I understand you guys are supposed to be very civilized, some of America's best and brightest, so I don't have to worry about that. But I, I still have a bone to pick with Trey. He had one bumper sticker that I can't forgive him for. It said, Beat Duke, vote Grayson. <laughs> All right, and you really have to understand, in Kentucky, they don't like Duke very much, okay? <laughs> and I did spend a few years there, and that one still gets under my skin. Uh, so, but I'm trying to make a comeback. I've sent two kids to the University of Kentucky just to try to make sure we don't I have any. I think we're fair. I think, we're, I think yeah, we're, we're, we're even on that. Yeah. Now, a couple of miles from here, you know, they, they dump the tea in the harbor. And some say, oh, just a bunch of crazy people upset about their taxes. Well, maybe. I think they were upset about taxes, but they were also upset about the process, about how their taxes were raised. They were worried about their rights as free English men, mostly men in those days, but they were worried about their rights being infringed, so they didn't have the same privileges and the same ability to vote or not vote for these tax increases. It was about the process as much as it was about the tax. One of the taxes that came upon the our uh, forefathers was a stamp tax. And the stamp tax was a tax on any of your papers and the only way they thought they could collect it because people weren't rushing forward to, to get their papers stamped because they were pretty upset about it. One way to check and see if your papers had been stamped was to go in your house. But they had the tradition of warrants even back then. And so they said, well, let's just let the soldiers write their own warrants. And in those days they called these the writs of assistance. And so James Otis wrote repeatedly and, and for a, probably a decade opposing these writs of assistance because they were generalized warrants. They weren't written by a judge. They were written by soldiers. They didn't have anybody's name on them. They just went from house to house searching through your papers. It was a big deal to our, to our revolutionary fathers. It was a big deal to the American Revolution. John Adams said that the spark that started the American Revolution was James Otis and his opposition to generalized warrants. It's the reason we have the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment said that we don't have generalized warrants in our country. The Fourth Amendment says that you have to have your name on the warrant, that you have to identify what things you want, and that there has to be probable cause. And that the warrant doesn't come from a policeman or a soldier, it comes from a judge. We separated the police power from the judiciary. A lot of what we did in setting our country up was to have checks and balances. We did not give all of the power to one person. They didn't give the power to declare war to one person. The president can't declare, declare war. He's not supposed to, or she's not supposed to. De declaration of war comes from Congress. But it was this idea of checks and balances. 
But when we were attacked on 9-11, we sort of forgot about all this stuff. We ran around in hysteria, pulling our hair and saying, take our freedom, take our liberty, we want security. And so they did what Franklin said you shouldn't do. You shouldn't trade your liberty for security or you wind up with neither. So with the Patriot Act, we allowed for the first time warrants to be written by soldiers, essentially soldiers, the police. We allowed the FBI to write them. The FBI now writes warrants to the tune of tens of thousands. I think the overall number is in the hundreds of thousands of warrants that are written by the FBI. Now, does this mean that I think the FBI are bad people? No, I play golf on occasion with my local FBI agent. We have this discussion. It's like, I don't think you're a bad person. The same way I don't think the president's a bad person. But I don't want to give so much power. I want that power to be separated out, and I want it to be in a balance, in checks and balances, so not too much gravitates. Why do I care so much about this? Why is it a big deal to me? Because occasionally we've gone overboard. About two weeks ago, I had lunch with Eric Holder, and they were telling me in the Department of Justice that Hoover's office used to be right here. And I said, my goodness, with the ever-present reminder that Hoover's office was right here, why wouldn't we more viscerally oppose allowing eavesdropping or allowing the collection of all our records, given what Hoover did? Hoover spied on 300,000 Americans, mostly people in the civil rights movement, also people in the, in the anti-war movement in the 1960s. We have had problems in our country where we've allowed too much power to gravitate. Many people say, oh, well, the NSA doesn't abuse the power. We're not listening to your phone calls. You're just being paranoid. They're collecting your records. They may or may not be listening to your phone calls, but they are on occasion, and there have been abuses. But even if there had been no abuses, I don't want them collecting your records for the possibility of abuse. We don't know who the next president will be. We don't know what particular pattern of bias people might bring into this, but we do know some of the things that have happened in our past. One of the other things that's bothered me in the last couple of years and that I've spoken out against is something called indefinite detention. In 2011, in our defense authorization bill, we allowed for the first time in our country someone to be detained without trial without attorney, without charge, forever. You say, that's crazy, I've never heard of that happening. It hasn't happened yet, and the president says he won't allow it to happen, but he signed the bill. It's not, not for me good enough. It's not about this president, it's about who may well use that power. And this president, above all others, ought to know what the government's done in the past. And it alarms me that he would sign this legislation. And if, he, if this president wanted to be a great president, he would have vetoed that piece of legislation. You say, well, it's a big deal, we're not gonna do it. The big deal is, is that we now can arrest people who they say maybe are unsafe for the rest of the country. So I had this debate with John McCain. Y'all had John McCain here the other day and he's on the floor and I said, my goodness, you would allow an American citizen to be sent to Guantanamo Bay for the rest of their life? And he said, yeah, if they're dangerous. I said, it sort of begs the question though, doesn't it? Who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? I've had this debate with the Wall Street Journal. They just say, enemy combatants, yeah, if they're enemy combatants, lock them up. Well, who are enemy combatants and who gets to decide? The Department of Justice has put out some criteria for people who might be terrorists, people who have more than seven days worth of food in their house. I met with some people who, uh, some of them were Mormon today, and I said, they'd have to lock up the whole state of Utah. People have more, more than one gun in the house. People who have missing fingers on one hand. People who have stains on their clothing are all things you're supposed to be suspicious. If you see these people, report these people. This is the kind of crazy foolishness and overzealousness we had in World War I when we had hundreds of thousands of people reported. We had people jailed who opposed the war. We had people jailed who opposed uh, selective service. Eugene Debs. The socialist, the perennial socialist candidate was put in jail for 20 years. Now, I have nothing in common. I like nothing about socialism or what he promoted. But my goodness, I would have stood there and defended a guy who's put in jail for opposing the war for 20 years. It took, it took Harding to get him out finally after 10 years in prison. He ran for prison with a number of his, his jail cell number, and he got over a million votes. We have made mistakes in our past. With indefinite detention, I tell people, if you want to think of the problem, you want to crystallize it into one quick story. Remember Richard Jewell? 
Richard Jewell was the guy, everybody said he was the Olympic bomber. He was convicted on TV, he had to be guilty. He was a loner, he had a backpack. He looked suspicious. He was kind of nerdy. Oh, that's right, he could be a student up here. <laughs> or me, I, w I was a nerd too, so I'm not casting aspersions. But here, here's the thing. Richard Jewell was convicted on TV, but he wasn't guilty. But imagine if Richard Jewell had been a black man in 1920 in the South. You see, the reason why we have these rules is because bias can enter into the law. Minority rights need to be protected. Individual rights need to be protected. And the thing is, is you don't, it's, you don't have to be a minority just because of the color of your skin. You can be a minority because of the shade of your ideology. So we do have to protect these things. We should protect against indefinite detention. And the president could have been a real hero. Saying he won't use the law isn't, isn't, a great, isn't a great stand. He could have vetoed the legislation a week later, they would have sent it to him without it in there. But that's the kind of leadership we need in our country. And there are dangers to where we are on this. And if we let it go too far, if you let your phone records be scoured and collected and you just say, the government says, trust me, we won't look at them. Two Stanford students developed an app recently and they put it on cell phones. And this app sort of collects your phone data voluntarily to show what you can collect, what the government can figure out from boring old phone records. What they found is, is that in most of the people, I think it was 15 out of 18 people they looked at out of the 500, they could tell what religion you were. They could tell what doctor you went to see. They could, for the most part, tell what diseases you had. Think about it this way. The government says that your credit card statement is not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Now they say, oh yes, we'll have privacy controls and this and that, and we're not gonna read it, but they always conclude every statement by saying the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect your records. Your records are not protected. This is something that needs to be adjudicated. I'm fighting this in the court, and I want it to go all the way to the Supreme Court. But think about what's on your credit card statement. We can tell whether you sm smoke, whether you drink, whether you gamble, and how much. We can tell what magazines you read, what books you read, where you, you know, think about what's on your credit card statement. It's nobody's business what you do on your credit card statement. There should have to be an independent body, a judge. There should have to be probable cause. These protections are for all of us. I think they're very important. I think it's an issue of our age. I'll continue to fight this issue, and I hope you'll join with me in saying enough's enough. We need to get our Constitution back. Thank you very much.